On behalf of the stewards, I welcome you to worship at Wesley this morning. You will notice that some of our service has been recorded in Wesley for the first time since lockdown. I welcome also our minister, Reverend Georgina Bonsi Simpson, to lead our worship this morning. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. A warm welcome to you as you join us in worship. I pray that this time will be a time of refreshing as we join together as a community of believers to praise and honour our God. The Lord Almighty is with you. The God of Jacob is with us. Let us remain silent for a few moments. A reading from Psalm 139, verses 1 to 12, and 23 to 24. The leader of David, a psalm. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. 
If I make my bed in shell, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Now let us make our prayers of adoration and confession. Let us pray. Jesus, stand among us in thy risen power. Let this time of worship be a hallowed hour. May we know you close in our homes and in our hearts. Breathe the Holy Spirit into every heart. Bid the fears and sorrows from each soul depart. May we know that we are known and held by a loving God, in whose presence we melt before for whom, from whom nothing is hidden. And we come before you saying that we are sorry when we have not loved you with all our hearts and trusted you, O God. We have not loved our neighbour as ourselves. We've not loved ourselves made in your image. Forgive us and heal us in the name of Jesus. May we know life, life in all its fullness. Amen.
reading is taken from Genesis 28, verses 10 to 19a. Jacob's dream at Bethel. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you, you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke up from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Amen. Jacob was traveling after a period of turmoil for him. He knew he behaved badly with his brother. His father had forgiven him and given him the blessing that he didn't deserve and sent him off to find another wife from a place that he knew well. He set off and he didn't complete his journey in a day and needed to find somewhere to sleep. It wouldn't have been my choice or any of ours in this day and age to get a stone to rest our heads on, but that's what he did. And he slept, fitfully it would seem. And when he woke up, his vivid dream was still there in his mind. It must have seemed an amazing, an unlikely thing for him to dream. A ladder going up to heaven, angels going up and down, and a voice saying, your descendants will be many, many, and I will look after you and them. I don't suppose until that moment he'd felt too close in the recent time to God. But God had spoken to him of that he was sure. And he went on to find a wife to come back to be the father of 12 sons, if nothing else, and for his descendants to live and prosper in the end. Many years ago now, we moved down to this area from Merseyside. We had a son and we became involved with Holmer Green Methodist Church. We joined a house group, and particular, I particularly enjoyed discussions there. 
I didn't go to prayer meetings. Prayer wasn't something that I felt, for me, was in public. And then one day I woke up and in my head I could hear the words, you will be a preacher. Well, I perhaps had a feeling that Jacob had had in his experience. God speaking to me? No. And for about three months, I alternately thought, a preacher? Hmm. And a preacher? Definitely not. But that thought, that instruction carried on. And I did go to speak to my class leader who, who sent me on to my minister and I began training to be a preacher, a local preacher in the Methodist Church. Sometime during that period, when I thought enough was enough, David and I, both at the same time, almost, spoke to each other about the possibility of adopting. We thought we were a one-child family, but it turned out not. And for a number of years after that, it was my dread that a third call would come to me. Barbara, you're going to be a missionary. Fortunately, it never came, and we are still here. But that first call had a profound effect on me, as I'm sure that Jacob's did on him. A man who hadn't always done what was good and right, and yet God had a plan for him, as in the end I was able to admit that God had a plan for me.
Gospel reading is from Matthew chapter 13. It is in two parts. The parable of weeds amongst the wheat, and then Jesus explains the parable of the weeds. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Then do you want us to go out and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first, and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Let anyone with ears listen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to thee, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus lived in an agrarian society, so it is not surprising that he used farming metaphors as concrete examples to explain the mysterious nature of the kingdom of God. Last week's text, the parable of the sower, focused on the yield produced by the seed that fell on good soil. In contrast, the parable of the weeds, sometimes called tears, focuses on the judgment that will befall all causes of sin and all evildoers. On a first reading, the parable of the weeds appears to describe a them and us situation, tempting us to begin thinking who the evildoers are and who the children of the kingdom are. A close reading of the text, however, reveals that it is one that cautions us about our discipleship, about our relationship with others, and offers us encouragement. 
In the parable, the one who sows the weeds among the wheat is called an enemy. But who is the enemy? Now we encounter the word enemies three other times in the Gospel of Matthew. Let's look at one of these. The first time is in Matthew 5, where we are told to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Let's think about this for a moment. If these enemies are destined for a furnace of fire, why did Jesus ask us to love them in the here and now? And if God, the one who judges all of us, causes the sun to rise on both the evil and the good, without distinction, what should our attitudes be towards our enemies? And can we be absolutely certain who is good and who is evil? From Jesus' perspective, it is not as straightforward as we make it to be. Now it gets even more complex when we turn to Jesus' explanation of the parable. In verses 38 and 39, the enemy who sows the weeds is identified as the devil, also called Satan. While the weeds are children, are called children of the evil one. Now, as with the word enemies, the word devil appears three other times in the Gospel of Matthew. Let's look at the final reference to the devil, which is found at the conclusion to the parable of the sheep and goats in Matthew 25. Jesus turns to the goats and condemns them to the eternal fires prepared for the devil. Now the goats in that parable had thought that they were followers of Jesus. But Jesus says their actions or lack thereof show them to be children of the evil one. Now you would think that the difference between weeds and wheat would be obvious, but it is not. Scholars tell us that the weeds in the parable are likely darnel, a weedy grass that looks like wheat until it matures. While the plants in the field are young, the good wheat and the invasive weeds are indistinguishable and intertwined. In the parable, the householder wisely advised his slaves, in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until it is harvest time. It is important not to damage the roots of the wheat. Now, as good stewards, we must do what is best for all, even if the weeds will survive until harvest. However, in the parable, the slaves of the householder notice the difference right away. So why does the householder delay? Is it because we, the servants, are too hasty to judge which is which? Or because we are not in a position to judge? Is it so that we give ourselves more time 
to extend God's grace to others? Or is it to allow us time to reflect on whether we are the wheat or, or the weeds? Brothers and sisters, think about the number of times we have been quick to judge others from their looks, their speech, or their situations. A homeless person asks for some change. A single mother with children who is on benefits. A young man who's just got out of prison can't find a job, and that is their problem. We sometimes hear people say it's their own fault for making bad choices. They're lazy, or our hard-earned taxes have been supporting these people in prison and they're living cozy lives there. She's on benefits and buys such expensive trainers for her children. Even within our different Christian denominations, we are so quick to judge those, for example, who worship in Pentecostal or charismatic traditions. And we stand back and say, oh, they keep speaking in tongues, and oh, they're making all of that up. Is it ours to say? Do we know? Do we really know? The work of setting the world right is the work of our God incarnate who may be actively at work in their lives too. Now through this parable, Jesus reminds us that we live in a hostile world where good and evil are intermingled and where we must live cooperatively for the good of all. Most importantly, he reminds us also, that we ought to leave judging others and judgment to God. As Jacob in our Old Testament reading did, we are to live in awe in the presence of a just God who meets us where we are, who is with us and will keep us wherever we go. It is my prayer that in our struggles for truth and justice, we will confront one another without bitterness and without being judgmental, that we will work together with love and respect for each other and for our neighbours who may be so different to us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
psalmist wrote, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and mountains fall into the heart of the sea. We come now with our prayers for others, confident that our God is the God of the psalmist, who will hear and answer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, over the past few months, our world and our own lives have changed in ways we could not have imagined, and our confidence has been shaken. But we thank you that you are still our refuge and strength, and that you are ever present to help us. We pray today for those who are ill, both those suffering from the virus and in other ways. We pray for those known to us, waiting for or recovering from surgery, and we ask for your healing hand to be upon them. We pray for all those who wait anxiously for test results or medical appointments, and we pray that you will give them your peace. We pray for all who have been bereaved in recent months, and for those who are close to death, and for their families. We pray that you will give them strength and comfort. We pray for those who are suffering mentally because of the effects of lockdown, and for all those who are feeling anxious, lonely or isolated. We pray for families and for those who are suffering domestic violence and we pray that they will get the help that they need. We pray for all who have lost their jobs, or who are worried about employment, or their business, or about education. We pray for all hope seeking to help the most vulnerable in our town, and we pray particularly for the work of OneCan, Wickham Homeless Connection, and Wickham Refugee Partnership. We pray for our church and all the churches in this town as we seek ways to bring your good news to others in our changed circumstances. We pray also for our wider world where many are suffering through war, climate change and natural disaster and whose situation has been made worse by the virus. We pray for agencies such as All We Can and Christian Aid and all their local partners. We pray for ourselves and in a moment of quiet bring to you now our own concerns and fears. We pray also that you will use us where possible to be the answers to our prayers and that you will show us how we can help others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers as we bring them now in the name of Jesus, who taught us when we pray to say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Now let us receive the blessing. As we go from here, hear again the promises of God, made long ago to our ancestor Jacob, and still true for us today. I am the Lord your God, the God of Abraham and Isaac. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. I will not leave you until I have done everything that I have promised. Let us go from here in the assurance that our faithful God goes with us. Amen.